Okay. Well, so thanks very much, uh, Peter, for the introduction. Thanks very much to all the organizers for the invitation to come here. It's been a, a very exciting set of talks and uh, I think a really very exciting theme for the workshop. One, one common thread through a lot of the talks so far has really been the way in which the rise of the web, the internet, and really global world-spanning information networks have changed science and technology fundamentally and changed a lot of the technological uh, affordances in, the, in our lives. Um, and I wanted to talk about some of the societal impacts of that, and in, in particular, the way in which this projects in, in, into, our, into, into the way that every, 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 everyday life is lived. Um, and I want to focus on two of these in particular. The first is that really because of these networks, there's been a profound transformation in the way in which knowledge is produced and shared. From a world 20 years ago where knowledge was really produced centrally at great capital expense and handed down from a few central authorities, from news organizations, from publishers, from the academy, to a world where it emerges bottom up from millions and really hundreds of millions of us each providing our own small piece of the picture with very different degrees of credibility, authority, different underlying motivations. And trying to make sense of that new world is a huge challenge. A second is the way in which pe how people interact and communicate. Again, from a world a half century ago where c social structure was much, much more regionally and locally based, very much based on local communities, to one in which it's fractured into lots and lots of different overlapping digital circles through things like instant messaging, global telephony, social networking sites, and so forth. And in the process, in dealing with that as a, as a, as a field, with these kinds of artifacts that we've created, I would claim something new and sort of magical has happened to computer science as a field, as a discipline. And that's really that our technological networks have become entwined and intertwined with our social ones, with social networks, to the point where we can never really separate them apart of ever again. So as these pictures su 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 suggest, with social structure overlaid on top of physical network structure, we now have these systems that have to be reasoned about together. And if you think about all of the large uh, new websites over the past half decade, things like Facebook, LinkedIn, Wikipedia, YouTube, Flickr, Dig Delicious, Twitter, and so forth, all of these are really these fundamental, as was being discussed in the earlier panel session, hybrids of human social structure with the underlying technological and computational infrastructure. And the point is, that raises some really new and fundamental challenges for the foundations of computing. And there are really two, two challenges. Uh, one is, how do we design in this space, right? How do you design when the constraints on your system are not just technological and computational ones, but social ones, right? And are also the population level feedback effects that happen when you aggregate millions of people and give them different incentives and different external forces on them. And what's been happening is that you've seen the emergence of a number of sub areas within computer science in the past decade that really try to combine social models and social science ideas with core ideas from, from, from computing and build on a foundation of both. And this is the areas of complex networks and network science, areas of algorithmic game theory and multi-agent systems about how to build systems with incentives, the whole field of social media and all the kinds of systems that come with that, reputation systems like on eBay, recommendation systems like on Amazon, social contagion and viral marketing, all of these are things that have emerged from this attempt to design in the face of simultaneous human and technological constraints. Now, this has been, I think, almost a little sort of worrisome for people trained traditionally in computer science, right? Large parts of the field, I think, are somewhat skittish about dipping a toe in these waters, because we like reasoning about systems that are formal and precise, like the kinds of computer systems that we're used to building, and somehow dealing with large human populations is new territory. Humans are unpredictable, it's sort of hard to reason about them, and so there's been questions about how do we really interact with economics and sociology and political science and all the areas that we're going to need. And my argument here is that as a field, we have no choice. This is not really a question of whether we want to do this, it's really in the fact that the systems that the way our systems are being used is by these large aggregates of millions of people who do respond in these complex ways. And it's going to be inevitable that we're going to see increasing contact, I think, between computer science and these areas of social science, economics, sociology, political science, and, 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 and others. The second point, which I want to spend uh, a number of slides on, is really a possible help with the first, kind of a possible remedy to these anxieties about how unpredictable uh, large human populations are. And it, it's really rooted in a very simple observation, which is that science advances um, when the invisible becomes visible, right? And that's true in physics, biology, chemistry, as, and it's also true in the social sciences. The systems that we're building are leaving digital traces, right, of millions of people's actions at very fine grain resolutions, and these can be studied, and these can actually be analyzed for really quantifiable patterns that we can develop models about and reason about. 
And that's, I, th I think, actually ushering in a, 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 a kind of new shift in the way one can do quantitative social science by looking at these traces of social interaction, right? Because one thing about social interaction is that it's somehow always been invisible, fleeting, ephemeral, and in some sense essentially unknowable, right? What is the social dynamic within a large group of people? And a lot of that is now being recorded through sites like Wikipedia, like Facebook, like LinkedIn, uh, like social media and uh, sites based on self-expression. So there's sort of two fundamental questions going on here. Um, and I, I want to talk about e each of them in turn. Um, the first is, from these raw digital traces, can we really recognize fundamental patterns of human behavior? Okay. Um, and the second is, if we can do that, can we build models that address longstanding social science questions using a computational language, right? Using computational thinking. Now, the first of these, and let me talk for a bit about the first of these, it sort of gets to a point that um, Alfred actually mentioned when he talked about the idea of extracting meaning, right? There's sort of a hope that in aggregate, when you see this much human activity, there's a kind of meaning that bubbles up through it if we only have the tools to recognize it. It's also really a question about signals and noise in a sense. Right? There's a huge amount of noise in what goes on when you watch millions of people doing something on a, on a site like Wikipedia or on a site like YouTube or Flickr. Um, can we pull the signal out of the noise? So one interesting analogy for this actually is that um, later on in his, toward the end of his life, Carl Sagan wrote a paper in Nature, uh, which Nature put on the cover under the heading, Is There Life on Earth? Strange question for nature to be asking. But what was really going on was that he was looking at, Carl Sagan and his colleagues were looking at traces from the Galileo space probe as it serendipitously, serendipitously happened to pass over the Earth, and asked as a control on all of our exobiology work and all of our search for extraterrestrial life, would we have been able to tell that there was life on Earth from the raw emissions coming from the surface of the Earth? Now, in our case, we have a computational system, but we want to ask the same question. We want to take something like Flickr which is a giant photo sharing site where people all over the world take photos, they upload them, they geotag them where they took them, and they tag them with text saying what they're about. Could we look at that if we were Martian scientists, as in Carl Sagan's thought experiment, and recognize the outlines of what the United States looks like and where people visit and what they do? And the fact is, there's actually an amazing amount of signal in one of these systems. So what we did in, in this example, I'll show you a picture on the next slide, we took essentially, in non computational terms, a big giant blank canvas of paper, and we threw tiny dots on it everywhere where a photo had been uploaded from Flickr. And we looked at it and we tried to find hotspots on that map. We said, where are the hotspots at, say, a 60 mile radius? And in those hotspots, what are the text tags that are most distinguishing, that most stand out? Secondly, let's go into each of those 60 mile radius hotspots and look at, say, a 100 yard hotspot. People are very exact when they, right? When you take a picture of the Washington Monument, you tag it differently from you take it of the Capitol. And so, what are the tightest hotspots within each of those regions? And what are the tags that stand out there? And you can construct a picture, which, there we go. Um, you can look at the screen. I'll, t I'll, I'll, I'll try zooming in a bit on it here. So first of all, the fact that you see a map of the US here is purely in your own imagination. These are, again, dots on a blank canvas. And these are the population centers. And it's not just population centers, but you can see all the interstates. You can see the interstates converging on Tulsa, Oklahoma. You can see in Interstate 70 as it passes from Pittsburgh to St. Louis, which for some reason is a very heavily photographed stretch of road compared to Interstate 80 and 90. I don't know why, but it somehow emerges from the data. And you can see, just as in those map puzzles that you buy for five-year-olds annotated with landmarks of the United States, you, you see names of cities, which we didn't pick, right? They, they come out of the most outlying Flickr tags, right? That population center is clearly called Boston, and that one's called Manhattan. That one's called Philadelphia. And within those, you find the most heavy, heavily used 100 meter hotspot. And you see names like Fenway Park, Liberty Bell, Empire State with canonical images for them. What were all those people looking at when they were there? Well, lots of them were looking at the pigeons sitting on the sidewalk, their friend, the mailbox. But if you look at the consensus in aggregate, you get canonical photos of all these landmarks. And so the message really is that yes, Flickr has enough raw data for Martians to be able to build credible tour guides to the United States. <laughs> And that's all rustic. This is all in Flickr. As in, all the, all the words, the images, and the dots are purely in Flickr. There was no human anything. We have one for Europe that was created with the same software, which I have on my laptop, but not here. And how about the geolocation? The geolocation was provided by the human user. So some small fraction of the Flickr photos are geotagged by people. Some very small fraction are the GPS supplied by the camera you're using. Uh, some larger fraction are geotagged by the user. OK. You can do this with other things, right? And this activity becomes kind of addictive. You, you can build maps of stuff from raw signal, right? So you can, for example, we're interested in the news cycle, the 24-hour news cycle in the three months leading up to, to, to the election. So you, you go to something like Spinner, which feeds raw news, 
newsfeed, and you look for quoted phrases. What are the quoted phrases? So it's again a hotspot detection thing, but now it's hotspots in time. What are the quoted phrases that stand out most and at different points in time? Right? Now this is actually more complicated than it looks because any phrase used by the news and used by bloggers has been excerpted, paraphrased, redacted, mistyped, and so forth. You actually need to use the same kind of mutation analysis that you use when you do genetic sequencing to find clusters of similar phrases. But you actually find a picture that looks cyclical, that looks tidal, goes week by week through, th through this period. Again, we can zoom in in case you want to see some of these. Obviously some of these quotes are contentious, controversial, et cetera. You know, we'd sort of happy that maybe this whole period is behind us. But the point is these were things Millions of Americans were paying very, very close attention to the news, were really voracious consumers of this news. These phrases had meaning to them. They affected public opinion. They affected who people voted for. And this was all being done with, I would argue, relatively primitive tools, right? So the fact that something like Google News is able to aggregate large amounts of news sources is an amazing tool, but it doesn't give you a map of the different, of the whole landscape of the, of the, of the thing. It doesn't let you dissect different points of view. And I think in the end, critical thinking in the age of the internet is going to involve being able to map that landscape in your head and having tools like, like this to potentially help you. Now, I said this was partly about signals and noise and what you can get out of, out of the noise and, and what you can extract. And again, this was purely automatically done. But there's also the question of building models, right? And using computational ideas to build models of these social processes. And so I wanted to spend a couple of slides walking you through an example of, of that in, in which we simultaneously look at a social phenomenon, try to build a computational model of it, and then try to verify it, uh, or in this case my colleagues verifying it using uh, social networking data. And so I picked the one, let's again see if this advances, which I sort of am most familiar with from my work over the past few years, which is trying to unravel this mystery of the six degrees of separation phenomenon, right? This idea that we're all six degrees of friendship apart in, in the United States or in global so, so society. Now this phrase six degrees has its roots in an experiment done by the social psychologist Stanley Milgram, one of the fam most famous social psychologists of the past half century, where he tried to figure out are we all a few handshakes apart. So he did an experimental design, again this was with no computers, no databases, with a $680 experimental budget. He picked starters in, out in the Midwest, in Nebraska, um, 200 people, gave them letters and said you have to reach this friend of mine who lives in Sharon, Massachusetts, suburb of Boston. You have to mail this letter you have to one person. You have to guess who's going to be most likely to forward this on successfully to this friend of mine, and we'll see how these chains funnel in toward a target. This took six steps on average, which was the origin of the phrase six degrees of separation. And he actually, in his paper on the left side of the screen, for those of you who can see it, he produced this histogram of how, how long the chains were. It's actually interesting that some colleagues of mine at Microsoft Research, Yuri Leskovich and Eric Horvitz, 40 years later, used 250 million people on Microsoft Instant Messenger, where they had the graph, and they actually built the same plot. And the plot actually is remarkably similar, and the number is still roughly six. Kind of amazing. But there's something else going on, and this was really what struck me, that the number six was only one part of the question. Because the way Stanley Milgram had designed the experiment, asking people to forward letters onto people, was really an amazingly subtle algorithmic kind of question. He was asking people to really execute a distributed algorithm in the sense of the talks we've been hearing before. Because you, with no knowledge of the global social network without the map of Microsoft Instant Messenger have to decide which of your friends is most likely to forward the message on effectively to this person who lives in Sharon, Massachusetts. All you know is where they live, you know something about their occupation, you know nothing, of, you don't know this person. And so I would argue this is really an example of a computational metaphor used to pose scientific questions, right? So as, 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 as Hal Labelson and Jerry Sussman say in the preface to one of the computer science books I read a long time ago, computational questions often shift the locus from what to how. How did the people find the paths? Now, the point is you can actually build models of networks and you can build models of random networks in which the links are created randomly from some underlying background distribution and yet out of that emerges a structure in which you can navigate without a map, in which the system self-organizes but you can funnel in toward faraway targets. I'm not going to be able to tell you how those models work, you can ask me in the question period, but there's sort of a key issue that came out of it, a key qualitative issue, and that was getting the balance of links right across distance, across physical and social distance. So essentially, in order for a social network to be navigable, in order for you to get from Nebraska to Boston, you have to both be able to take the big steps to get halfway across the country and the small steps. Once you're in the same town as the guy, you've got to actually get it to that person's house. So you have to find someone who knows them. So you need links at every distance scale. You need links at 1 to 10 miles, you need them at 10 to 100 miles, you need them at 100 to 1,000 miles. I tried drawing a little cartoon of this, but decided I couldn't compete with Saul Steinberg's New Yorker cover from 1976. It's exactly that way that we mentally organize maps of the world. We devote the same amount of mental real estate to our street corner as our block, as our neighborhood, the city, the US, the, the world, China, Japan, Russia, those bumps on the horizon. 
It's really not unlike how the USPS delivers, the US Postal Service delivers a letter to me, right? John Kleinberg, Upson Hall, Cornell University, Ithaca, New York, 14853. There's really six steps there. United States, New York, Ithaca, Cornell, Upson Hall, me and my office. But that's a network that's maintained at enormous capital expense to do precisely that. They built in that hierarchy. Here, the social network, the, the global social network, that hierarchy emerged on its own from some kind of random process. And the point was to find a model in which that was possible. Now, those models actually have had implications for the design of peer-to-peer -peer networks, for example. How can you search for files, right, through things like BitTorrent and so forth without a global map of the system? But also made a prediction about the world. And that part I found a little, it caused some amount of anxiety in me because I had made this prediction about the world. It was sort of a ridiculously concrete prediction about the world, that the social network ought to look like this if it's searchable. And the question was, is that really true? And this was another case where having massive data on human social interaction made it possible to answer that question. So David Levin Nowell, um, a former student of mine and some of his colleagues at IBM and Yahoo, looked at the live journal social network. They could have used any social network that has profile data because on these social networks, it's exactly designed to be able to do this kind of measurement. It has profiles where you say where you live and who your friends are. We can actually look at how friendships scale across physical distances. And what they found, and I won't be able to go into exactly what these plots are showing, that in fact, the distribution of friendships across distance very, very closely approximates the optimal spread of friendships for this kind of search. As in, they really were balanced across all these different scales of distance after you correct for population density effects and, and a number of other things. Okay? So I think this also tells us something about the continued geographic and local embedding of the internet, right? So even after the beginning of my talk where I say that the internet, and it's true, has really exploded notions of geography and so forth, there's still a very heavy geographic signature in how our friendships are formed, right? And all those intermediate scales of resolution are filled in. I think that's something we have to think about when we think about how social structure is mapped onto the internet. And of course, this answer to one question opens up an equally perplexing question, which is why has the global social network happened to self-organize in a way that's optimal for search? What are the evolutionary or selective pressures operating on the network that's driving it to the state? We have no idea, right? And that's a really, really basic scientific question that is gonna benefit from computational models, is gonna benefit from looking at data. And it's something, again, we really have no idea about and it's something any of us could really start thinking about right now. It's a question that, that's really that simple. So I'd like to wrap up. And in this, I've tried to argue that computational ideas play really two crucial roles. One is to design these systems that we're using that are inevitably merging human social structure with technological and computational systems. And secondly, computational ideas are crucial for modeling the social processes that result from that. And in the end, what we're left with is a set of hard scientific questions where computing is gonna be able to have a big impact and that address fundamental societal problems and fundamental problems about, again, how everyday life is lived in this, in this new world. One is, why do social processes produce the outcomes they do? Can we build predictive models now that we have this amount of data? And it's really arguing that questions that had once seemed important but simply too hard to make precise are becoming precise because we can watch what's happening. Secondly, all of this inter intertwined with the fact that the online worlds we build are produce a feedback. They affect the social processes. And so how they're affecting the processes and how the virtual and physical and geographic worlds merge and meet is going to be very important. Third, it's hard to talk about all these digital traces and raw signals and so forth without thinking about the effects of stockpiling of massive data. And this is a topic that's come up um, in a number of the talks and something that Eric Brewer talked about very nicely in the panel discussion. There are these looming privacy risks and that we're gonna have to think about. And moreover, we're gonna enter something else which I'm happy to discuss in the, in the panel session also. We're entering a phase of having software that really literally knows your beha behavior better than you do, right? Software that has a trace of every song you ever listened to while walking or driving to work, every book you've ordered, every person you've ever communicated with or lost touch with and when, it knows a lot about statistical regularities in your behavior over the past 10 or 20 years better than you consciously realize yourself. And the question is, do we want that kind of software? Do we want it to be constantly reminding ourselves of things, little long-term ticks that we have, little behavioral patterns? Because that's certainly possible. And it's a question of, of what we want to design into the system. And in the end, this is really about linking, right, computers as mediators, linking people to information and to each other. And so, in the end, there's this looming question of whether all of this is going to help, our, help us understand ourselves and understand each other any better. And I think that's gonna be a huge opportunity that computer science can also help with. I'll stop there, thanks very much.